BBC4 Collections, archive programmes chosen by experts. For this collection, Clemency Burton Hill has selected programmes featuring 20th century classical music composers. More programmes on this theme and other BBC4 collections are available on BBC iPlayer. The American John Adams is one of the best known and most frequently performed composers working today. He was born and brought up on America's East Coast, but after studying at Harvard, moved in the early 1970s to California, where he's lived and worked ever since. I grew up in a small, rural part of the country, and I remember as a, as a child imagining myself being a composer and imagining that, that you know, the landscape and, and the natural environment around me uh, was, was an integral part of my personality. And I guess I've retained that all these years. During a few weeks in December at the Châtelet Theatre in Paris, Adams is attending rehearsals for the world premiere of his latest work. El Niño is an oratorio based on the story of the Nativity, and it's the latest in a string of collaborations between Adams and the theatre and opera director, Peter Sellers. Um, for the course and stuff, will they be... John, as a composer, I think works a lot like Mozart and Verdi. John can use any style he feels like, whenever he feels like it. It's all there. And yet, by the time he's done, it's all John Adams. You know, it doesn't sound like anyone else. <laughs> you can't really mistake it for anyone else. Although El Nino is John Adams' first oratorio, he's written widely in a variety of musical genres, from operas, concertos, and chamber works, to film scores, rock, and electronic music. Combining critical acclaim with a popularity rare in contemporary music, Adams acknowledges musical influences ranging from Beethoven to Benny Goodman. I think my earliest memory was uh, when my uh, father brought home a, a, a 33 LP a turntable and he connected it to a, a little wooden radio that we had. We were living in a small town in Vermont at the time. And he brought two records. He brought one that had circus band marches, supposedly conducted by Bozo the Clown. Um, already my pedigree was starting. And uh, the other one was Tchaikovsky. I think it was Peter and the Wolf on one side, Prokofiev in the 1812 Overture on the other. And um, shortly after that, I, I think I started conducting with a, my mother's knitting needle. <laughs> that had a strong impact on you. Yeah, and then, of course, my parents were both uh, very good amateur musicians. My father played the clarinet and the saxophone, and my mother was a singer. There was always a lot of music in the house. What did your parents make of your early compositions? Well, I, I guess they were very thrilled. I mean, it's, it is sort of unusual for a seven or eight-year-old to start writing compositions. They themselves had grown up during the Depression and they hadn't been able to afford to go to college. So um, for me to be able to be well educated both musically and in the broader liberal arts sense was, was of intense importance to them. Growing up in New England, Adams encountered strong and formative musical influences that were to stay with him, from Charles Ives to gospel and church music. And presumably the, the major musical activity in terms of the community was, what, the marching band? I often say my childhood was very Ivesian, and it really was. I grew up in a small town. My father was my first teacher. I played in marching bands with my father. And uh, probably even a more important experience was that I played in a community orchestra that was uh, sponsored by um, the New Hampshire State mental hospital. Now, this was a hospital and we gave all our concerts to mental patients and some of these were severely disturbed people who were kept in lockdown wards and they didn't have a lot of the natural uh, inhibitions that quote-unquote normal people have 
So they would hear, they'd hear this pathetic, raunchy performance of, you know, I don't know, the Oberon Overture, and they would be crying and yelling and screaming and just going out of their minds with emotional outpouring. And, and um, you know, I realized at a very early age uh, how profoundly powerful music was. And probably this experience was the most emphatic example of that. I came of age during 1967, 1968. Uh, that was a period when um, if you were studying to be a composer, you know, the big, the big guns at that time were Stockhausen, Boulez, um, not to mention, of course, Schoenberg and Webern, who were the models that were presented to us in school. And at the same time, 1967, 1968, was the era of Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and John Coltrane and Otis Redding and the Supremes. And I experienced extreme cognitive dissonance during that time because, uh, you know, I, I was really strongly drawn towards the expressive and Dionysian side of, of rock music. I felt that it really defined my way of being and my cultural nexus in the world. And yet I was being told at college that, you know, the real thing was Webern's Symphony Opus 21. Um, so I was torn. I was literally just being ripped apart into two pieces. So um, that's probably the reason I fled the East Coast and went to the West Coast. Which was quite a, a seismic shift, wasn't it? To pack all your belongings into, did you have a Beetle at the time? I have Volkswagen Beetle. Seismic shift is a dangerous word <laughs> for, for someone going to San Francisco. Uh, but the um, defining moment in my life um, was, was to leave the East Coast and go to California. Having left the musical environment he saw as being too European in its outlook, Adams found in the West Coast a new, young and very American music scene that was defiantly doing away with traditional musical models. My generation was probably the first, particularly in America, to simply s say that, you know, this business of putting things in what the French call tiroirs, drawers or pigeonholes or, you know, neatly classifying things, is, is it's not interesting, it's not helpful, and it really has nothing to do with our experience. I mean, if you're gonna live in, in a contemporary urban setting, you're gonna be bombarded with music anyway. You can't go around with, with earplugs in your ears. Um, and you're either gonna be like John Cage and aggressively shut everything out or be indifferent to everything, which he claimed he was, or you're simply going to say, okay, that's life, you know? And everything, rave and, you know, ethnic music and Beethoven and Conlon Nancaro and Dixieland and, you know, traffic, all of that's going to come in and make some kind of uh, vast, uncontrollable, chaotic uh, joy or misery, as it were, in, in your head. In the vibrant music scene of California, Adams encountered not only the radical ideas of composers such as John Cage, but also the music of the minimalist writers Philip Glass, Terry Riley, and in particular, Steve Reich. Using as their compositional tools the most basic musical elements, such as repetition and rhythmic pulsation, the minimalists, for Adams, revealed huge musical possibilities. I was profoundly affected by Steve Reich's music. For me, it really pointed a way out of a terrible cul-de-sac. And I began participating in concerts and eventually started directing and producing them. We were doing a lot of Cajun, you know, happenings and a lot of pieces by Cage and his followers, you know, the American avant-garde. Um, and I, 
I felt that it was a lot of fun. It was fun putting the programs together, but it just simply didn't satisfy me on the really gut level. And um, it seemed to me that popular music was the only place where um, the anima was still alive, you know, where people actually were, were getting the same kind of emotional hit that they used to get with, you know, Tchaikovsky or Brahms or Wagner or Beethoven. And so when I heard my first minimalist pieces, I thought, oh, you know, there is a way to incorporate these fundamental materials and make an experience that is both new and also um, speaks in a kind of lingua franca that everyone can access. John, let's talk about one of your early, and I mean a, a real kind of early seminal piece, Phrygian Gates. What was the origin of that piece? How did it come about? I, in the 1970s, um, got very interested in, in um, waveforms. Um, I thought they were very beautiful, um, both in water and in sound. And I had never taken, you know, physics when I was in school, and so I was not very skilled. I couldn't do Fourier analysis or calculus or whatever, but I just was enchanted with the beauty of waveforms. Um, you know, there, there are waves called sawtooth waves, which if you look at them on an oscilloscope, they look just like a sawtooth, and they're very buzzy, and there are other, you know, we all know about sine waves, which are these perfect curves. There's a square wave. There are all sorts of modulated waves. And I thought I'd really love to write a piece that used waveforms. Um, and so in a sort of playful mode, I began improvising on the piano. And I would do a repetitive gesture, maybe da 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 in one hand and da 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 on the other hand. And so I imagined a work in which at least two and sometimes three or four waves would coexist, like the voices in a Bach fugue. And that was sort of the primary generating image of, of Phrygian Gates. It's probably the only piece of mine that even remotely behaves on the minimalist aesthetic. Uh, but even then, it was already trying to stretch the borders. It was already restless and uncomfortable within this, what I felt was kind of a, 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 a too overly rigorous uh, means of musical discourse. And so it becomes very violent. Why I call it gates is because I imagined that there were these gates in the musical structure, which when went through them, um, all of the music just suddenly was transformed into a, in a sudden and violent uh, transition, and of course this was violently opposed to the whole uh, theoretical process of minimalism in which nothing happens violently, totally. everything happens, you know, it's almost like Prozac, you know, every, everything is on this sort of single expressive level. I wanted to do was to utilize minimalism as a language, but I wanted to make the emotional envelope much wider um, so that a piece would have the potential of traveling through all kinds of uh, uh, emotional and psychological terrain in the way that a, a movement of a Mahler symphony does. And when my first pieces came out, pieces like Harmony Lera, Harmonium, Shaker Loops, um, I got severely criticized for it from both camps, you know, from people who hated minimalism dismissed me, and the people who loved minimalism thought that I was corrupting it. You know, they thought that I, would, I was uh, cheapening its, uh, 
its purity. So it was a very controversial period. Despite his new roots in California, the East Coast continued to inform and inflect Adam's music. His piece Shaker Loops for String Septet was inspired by the remote Shaker colonies of New Hampshire. Adam's most individual work to date, the music playfully mimicked the Shaker's ecstatic form of worship. It also saw Adams developing a new sound that was uniquely his own. Shaker Loops was a success right from the start. It was sort of charged with a, a kind of giddy energy uh, that, you know, really typifies a lot of my music. But the other thing about it was that it, it, was, it was my first piece in which I really consciously departed from the minimalist aesthetic. You know, I, I spoke earlier about bandwidths, and I, I felt that the bandwidth in Shaker Loops was satisfying to me because it had really uh, powerfully emotional moments in it. And it also had moments of, of almost complete stasis, you know, where there was hardly any movement at all in the music. And as a result, it, as a structure, as a musical form, I felt that it was richer and more varied and more human uh, than your, your standard minimalist piece. Shaker Loops was an immediate hit with audiences. One of Adam's most frequently performed works, it rapidly brought his music to wide public attention. I was at a music festival in New Hampshire staging Haydn's Armida, and two composers were featured in the festival that summer, and they were Elliot Carter and a young composer named John Adams. And I heard John's Shaker Loops. You know, there are a lot of wonderful people writing music right now, but not that many composers at the moment are writing music that's dramatic and theatrical. And here was this piece of John's, Shaker Loops, that was so theatrical, so, so built on these fantastic dramatic structures. So I you know, went up to him at you know, the picnic table outside after a concert <laughs> and said, you know, would you like to write an opera? You know, I've got a great subject, Nixon in China. And um, he said, uh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> and when he came to me with the idea, I, I, I just, I couldn't imagine an opera about Richard Nixon that, that was anything except a heavy-handed satire. And it, it, it took me a while to understand that it was really a brilliant idea. Two years later, he called me and said, are you still interested? I said, sure. <laughs> so we started working. <laughs> By the time it was premiered, Nixon in China had become the most talked about and eagerly awaited opera of the decade. Taking as its subject the historic meeting of Richard Nixon with Mao Tse-tung in 1972, it thrust opera right into the modern world of mass media. Nixon in China deals with very, very primal events in, in, in my life, you know, the struggle or the collision between capitalism, a market economy, and a, a way of life in which everything has a dollar value, and communism, you know, a clearly flawed and possibly, um, you know, unworkable system that still fundamentally had a rather utopian notion behind it. Has a, has a, has a kind of mystery. Has a, has a, has a kind of mystery. When 
I shook hands with I shook hands with Joe and Lie when I shook hands with Joe and Lie on this fair field outside meeting just how the whole world was listening and I the whole world was listening 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 420 passengers and crew on board a luxury Italian liner are being held somewhere in the eastern Mediterranean by Arab gunmen who are demanding the release of prisoners held by Israel. There are reports that... Their next opera, The Death of Klinghoffer, saw John Adams and Peter Sellers venturing into controversial territory. The story of the Palestinian murder of a Jew on board a hijacked cruise liner, Klinghoffer, from its first performance, met with public indignation and the outcry made John Adams' music front page news. There were articles in the New York Times every week for a month and, you know, the death of minimalism and, you know, bad taste and bad opera, you know, they were just horrible reviews. It was hard to weed out what was the result of political offense and, and what was the result of artistic offense. I think the main problem was that, um, you know, we had an opera in which we, we gave or we attempted to give equal uh, passion and equal humanity to both the Jews and the Palestinians. That it was such a firestorm is an indication of its power and its accuracy and its um, it put its finger right on the nerve. It became a kind of a black sheep, and very shortly after the first r round of performances, other productions, which had been virtually guaranteed, just started to disappear. You know, for inexplicable reasons, they were canceled. And uh, the opera's never been produced in the United States since then. The death of Klinghoffer was a passion story, was a memorial service was in fact exactly because the real life events had been given nothing but relentless CNN treatment. And so the question of why a 19 year old, you know, would want to die gloriously, the death of a martyr, for what cause? What is the spiritual life of a person who appears to us as a blip on the news? of, you know, four teenagers, you know, killed in, you know, a suicide bombing. Who are those people? What would make a human being offer their life that way? That's a pretty sacred question. It's a question that the news commentators are not capable of addressing. And so all of the works we've done are actually about touching another dimension to these events than they have on the evening news. Do you think there's a future for opera as a form? I think there's a great future for opera. Um, you know, it's really a matter of the, the power and the imagination of the composer. There's so many things that can go wrong in opera. I mean, you can have a great composer, but a bad libretto. You can have a great libretto, but a bad composer. You can have a good libretto and a good composer, but the structure just doesn't make it, or the composer doesn't really know how to write for voice, or the cast isn't good. I mean, they're just, every single possibility comes into play to defeat it. So it's very rare for a great opera to be created. 
And one of the key things for you, it seems very clear, is that, that you believe that, the, that opera can be a medium for telling very powerful, often politically loaded, contemporary story. Well, I'm always amused when people raise their eyebrows and discuss, you know, John Adams' operas as, as political operas or, you know, the dreadful term docu-opera. And what I, what I, my response is, well, you know, if I were a, a filmmaker um, or if I were a novelist, um, no one would give second thought to the fact that I, I you know, had my my film or my novel take place in the present and involve contemporary events. But I think it's more a comment on, on the way in which we regard opera. We really do regard it as an antiquated art form. John goes next to Mozart and Verdi and Monteverdi as, you know, one of the great line of theater composers. You know, the other thing is John is not stylistically afraid. He can do anything he feels like. And so he can quote Hildegard here and move into something Cuban, you know, two bars later. Or indeed, have both things happening at the same time. Because that is the nature of our reality. I can be reading Hildegard in a nice chair like this and listening to Cuban music. Like that is actually a normal experience for us right now. And so, of course, John's music and the incredible range inside his music reflects the complexity of everybody's daily life and the fact that all these things that normally could never have lived next to each other are all living next to each other in our lives. Despite absorbing many styles into his work, Adam's music retains a certain Americanness, and he's often chosen to set to music some of the great works of American poetry. I was drawn to Emily Dickinson's uh, poetry because of its introversion, uh, its, its conciseness, its wisdom, and also because of this uh, incredible sexual energy that, that uh, sort of lies underneath. I it's mean, incredibly the, graphic, isn't it? It is very graphic, and particularly in the poem Wild Nights, which I, I chose to end Harmonium with, I, I felt that this image of this turbulent sea and this, this boat that's just rocking in the storm uh, and then finally finds a, a harbor in which to rest is, is, is you know, it, as I've often said, it was, it was like a Mick Jagger lyric, you know, it just had this incredible sensual sexual energy to it. really notable aspect to the composition of, of, of Harmonium is, is the sound of the choir right at the start with the John Donne poem and you just get that no, 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 which is a very distinctive Adams quality. Why did you choose to do that? I mean, you, you must have had some people giggling, didn't you, at the first performance at, at, at that endless repetition. I can't tell you why I did it because I was such a young composer at the time. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, I was drawn to the poem Negative Love by John Donne because I thought the title was so amazing. It sounded to me like the name of a punk band. And, uh, you know, I thought, what is this poem Negative Love? And um, I still to this day don't really know what the poem means. So I played on the idea of negative and the word no and and use no as a sort of structural building block and repeating it hundreds of times and building up big chords that sort of crested like a big tsunami, a big tidal wave. Even though my pieces often uh, tend to feel like journeys into the unknown, um, I use recall and I'm using it more consciously these days because I think it's really important. It creates a structural identity. And I tell audiences, go into this piece as I went into it, as I composed it, which is that I, 
I, I left on a journey one morning, you know, and I went in a, in a direction. I had a remote idea where I was going, but I didn't know what the landscape was. And so the musical form really is that landscape coming, you know, in my music. And I think it's one thing that's very unique about my music. I don't know if it's this, of any other composers. Uh, there is this effect in the music of a, of a small event appearing on the horizon and then getting larger and larger and larger and then passing you. And meanwhile, another one has already started and that's coming and then, so these musical images come on the screen, they dominate the screen and then they recede into the distance. And that, that is really my approach to form. Uh, and I think if people understand that when they hear big pieces, um, it will help them because they won't get all, you know, wound up and fraught with tension that they might be missing something. Is that, is that a, a, a description you could apply to grand pianola music? Yes, I think grand pianola music is a perfect case in point. There are more road signs and, uh, you know, ridiculous details coming up on the side of the road in that piece. Some pieces are far more serious. But uh, certainly the, the formal structure of grand pianola music is very much like a, a tour. Pianola music, described by one critic rather memorably as Charles Ives on amphetamines, it's kind of got everything in it, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I, I was in a very uh, loose stage, or my filters were very loose when I wrote that. I, I, I wrote it very quickly, and I think that I, I was aware that I was just, um, you know, letting everything come in and then letting everything come out. I wanted to be almost as if I was in a mode of automatic writing. And there's a great deal of humor in the piece. Um, it offended some people when it f was first performed. Um, people thought it was like a bad joke or, you know, in France they said oh, it was uh, la musique uh, des consommateurs. Uh, you know, it was consumer's music and they likened it to McDonald's or Disney, they all miss the point. I mean, the point is that it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it was meant as an entertainment. Um, although much of it's very lyrical and very kind of low-keyed and very pastoral. But, uh, you know, it started with the image. I was driving up a freeway um, in some, you know, remote part of the route between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And, and uh, in this dream, uh, a big, long black limousine passed me at very fast speed, and as it came up by me, I realized it wasn't a limousine at all. It was a 60-foot-long grand piano with all sorts of arpeggios streaming out of it. <laughs> Strange dream. And, and so I, you know, that became the, sort of the, the starting point for what obviously was a, a very surreal and I think very funny piece. Grand pianola music embraces both sides of Adam's musical personality. The old style of the East Coast, with traces of Ives and Beethoven, combined with a powerful sense of newness and modernity picked up in California. Artists reflect the world around them, including the technological world. And I think that what makes art move, what makes it evolve, is advances in technology. You know, I don't think uh, minimalism would ever have been thought of were it not for the tape recorder. Um, and I don't think that uh, James Joyce would have had his verbal ideas if it had not been for film uh, and radio. Um, and certainly jazz would not have been invented had it not been, you know, for the saxophone and, and the modern piano. 
Since the early 1970s, when he built his own synthesizer, Adams has been fascinated by technology. For his piece, Solinimsky's Earbox, he developed a computer program that processes the musical material, multiplying it into ever more difficult and complex patterns. you ever make allowances for performers? I mean, some of your music is fiendishly difficult to play, not least because it requires such fierce concentration. Um, you must surely on occasion have to make allowances for performers. Well, I don't think there's anything that I write that's, uh, that's unreasonable. Uh, you know, the things that Ligeti writes that are unreasonable, and yet there's, there's a kind of uh, uh, wonderful quality to somebody struggling to play something that's basically unplayable. I mean, it has its own imaginative quality. Um, but everything, you know, I'm a conductor, I'm a practical performing musician, so there's really nothing in my music that can't be done. You know, and I even hear youth orchestras playing pieces like Harmony Lara, which 15 years ago people thought were, was on the edge of unplayability. So I, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, I'm on over the edge in terms of uh, uh, difficulty. Harmony Lehrer, named after a treatise on harmony, I suppose you could say, by Arnold Schoenberg. Rather a strange title, connection for you of all people to have made. Well, my teacher uh, in college had been a student of Schoenberg when Schoenberg was an exile in Los Angeles. And, and, and my teacher had brought the gospel of, of, of Schoenberg with all its good sides and all its dark, uh, destructive sides uh, to Harvard. And, um, you know, I, I absorbed it and then rebelled against it violently. And um, I think I had a very ambivalent feeling towards Schoenberg because I, I admired his seriousness and his uh, visionary quality, but I also felt that it was with Schoenberg that the whole agony of modern music had begun. And when I wrote this work, Harmony Lara, I, I used this title, which, which is the title of a book that Schoenberg wrote about tonal harmony, and I used it in a very ironic way because I felt that uh, my piece was about harmony, it was about tonal harmony, but it was also about spiritual harmony. And, and of course, the word Harmony Lara in Germany uh, means the book of harmony or a textbook on harmony, a treatise on harmony. And what I wanted to be saying was that it was also uh, my statement on my own spiritual sense of, of harmony, which was something that I had to struggle very hard to achieve as a, as a young man. El Nino sees John Adams collaborating again with Peter Sellers and also conductor Kent Nagano, who's frequently performed and recorded Adams' work. And in this case, it's a project of particular excitement and expectation for John Adams. Mm -hmm. I just wanted a little gentler. For probably most of my life, I've always wanted to write a piece about the nativity. And, and I don't know, you know, it may just have to do with my growing up in a small town and going to the Episcopal Church and experiencing, you know, a small town American 
Christmas uh, with Handel's Messiah sung by a, you know, a local choral society. And um, I always wanted to write something. I wasn't sure whether it was a ballet or an opera or what. And I was asked to write an opera uh, by the Châtelet in Paris. And I didn't have an idea for an opera, but I said, but you know, I've always wanted to write this piece, which for lack of a better term is an oratorio. Um, and I knew that Peter Sellers loved to stage or oratorios, so I said, "What if we, you know, what if we work together on on an oratorio about the birth of Christ?" How do you begin a piece, compositionally speaking? Oh, that's always hard. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a, you know, an orchestra piece or a solo piano piece or an opera. It's it's always hell. Um, you know, I always ask myself, why, why did I, why did I decide to do this? <laughs> I don't have any ideas. I thought I did, but in fact, I have no ideas. And usually, in fact, inevitably. Um, there's a terrible period that can go on for months in which I throw away everything and I just get deeply depressed. I'm not a pleasant person to be around. I don't know how my family puts up with me. And then one morning I wake up and there's no more time to screw around. You know, I suddenly realize, uh-oh, there's not enough time to finish this before the premiere. And then I sort of go into panic mode. <laughs> and when I'm in early panic mode, I'm very happy. Um, that's the best period. And then as things approach and this terrible crunch, then um, I bitch and moan a lot. Uh, but I work feverishly, you know, around the clock, and um, the piece always gets done at the last minute. <laughs> but it's also deeply practical, isn't it? I mean, if you've got a deadline you've got to meet, then the music's just got to be composed. I mean, all those great stories about Rossini being locked in a tower and forced to come up with an overture because he still hadn't got around to writing one. Well, creating things is very painful, and um, it's painful for many reasons. It's painful because you come face to face with your own mortality, and there's always the fear. First, when you're too young, you have nothing to fall back on, so there's just this horrible fear of the unknown. And then if you're lucky enough to have success in life, then there's the fear that you can't repeat it. <laughs> And you're only as good as your worst gig, aren't you? That's right. And or you know, people are going to want the same thing, and I'm not going to give it to them. And I mean, there's just an endless number of of possibilities to uh, you know to suffer and get depressed over. <laughs> and also, of course, there's a whole issue about how you, as a composer, let go. How you let go of material. I mean, how do you wave it bye bye? Well, it's not an ideal situation. I mean, I I do take basically the you know the point of view of of a the typical classical composer that you know i can i can babysit a piece up to a point you know attend rehearsals and get it as right as i can but i'm defenseless against somebody butchering my pieces you know i'm i'm unfortunately i've been around long enough now that i've at the stage now where people are beginning to interpret my pieces you know and i will show up and hear a some boneheaded conductor doing a piece at half the tempo or twice the tempo or, or bringing out some inner line that he idiotically thinks, uh, you know, is going to make for a more original performance. And uh, you just have to suffer through things. You understand why people like, you know, Stravinsky ended up as such cranks at the end of their lives because they had to suffer through people playing the Rite of Spring badly. From, from where I was sitting, the women have a, a nice intensity, but the men seem to just be a little too right. powerful. Okay. And this is, after all, a feminist. Just do this. There he is. <laughs> what makes El Nino, if, if it has any breakthrough quality for me, which I think it does, is that it is, it is more a vocal piece than anything I've ever written before. I mean, although there's a lot of singing in Nixon and China, the, the basic generating 
musical engine was pulsation and this sort of inexorable machine that was born in minimalism. Uh, and the singers tend to float along on top. Um, so in a sense, you know, I've sometimes likened the Nixon Orchestra as this gigantic ukulele just sort of strumming away. But with El Nino, the fundamental uh, musical impetus is, is the voice, and it is singing. And so things are very, very different in this. It's really a vocal work, um, and that is the generative impulse in it. And um, I'm very, very excited about this, you know, ha hearing really great singers like Don Upshaw and Lorraine Hunt Lieberson and Willard White singing this uh, makes me realize that, um, you know, I may be at the beginning of a whole new stage in my work. If you had to put into a nutshell what it is through your career you have wanted and continue to wish to achieve with your music, what would it be? The only thing that would give me really great satisfaction, if I could you know, look down from the cloud or from, know from beyond the grave what people are saying, is people could say, oh, Adams, he was a master. Um, and I don't mean a genius um, or even a great, great visionary. I just mean a master in the sense that a, you know, someone who carved a, you know, a, a, a donkey on the f face of the Notre Dame Cathedral, or someone who wrote a beautiful motet, you know, in the 14th century, but just did it really well, and did it with a consummate sense of uh, technique and mastery, of devotion and of a certain spiritual reverence. That to me is a master and that, that's the best I could hope for. <laughs>